morning, everyone. Let's all stand if you if you can. This morning. Every time we do praise and worship, really, what it is, the main thing that it is, is a reminder for us of the goodness and greatness of God. God is not made bigger by our songs. He's already great. He's already wonderful. He's already magnificent in all the things that he is. But when we sing, we stir it up in ourselves, and we remember the goodness of God. And I don't know about you, but I have gone through a few things in the last several months that have shaken me. They've tested me. They've tried me. They've not been fun. They've not been good. And it's at those times that I need to remind myself of the goodness and the greatness of God. More th- Now, the reality is we need to think of those things, and we need to be doing that on a daily basis in the good times and the bad times as well. But especially in the bad times is when we need to stir it up, right? Psalm 103 says, uh, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Forget not all his benefits. David was going through something, I believe. And he was speaking to himself and stirring it up in himself to remember the goodness, the greatness, the the mercy, the faithfulness of God. And so that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to just stir that up and say, Soul, bless the Lord. So bless the Lord.
Our God is a great God. You know, we just said, great are you, Lord. And he's great in the good times. He's great in the hard times. He's great at every time, every trial, every tribulation we go through. It doesn't change who he is. You know, victory is not every problem going away. Victory in Jesus is knowing that he is who he is. It's rejoicing in who he is. We're going to have different things. You know, this week has been a rough week for a lot of us because we've lost some people in our lives this week. And there's been some sickness and there's been some things that have felt like, you know, I was, I, I was talking to Ron last week and I said, I'm ready for some sunshine, you know, because of all the rain. It just feels like that. But, you know, I felt like we went through a blizzard this week. You know, the, the enemy's just been throwing, throwing, throwing. But you know what? It doesn't matter because this time on this earth is just a part, a speck of our eternity. It's just a part. We go through these trials so we can stand victorious. And then we have our entire eternity to spend with our God and King. From this, the day you get saved from that time and going forward, that is what it's all about. So yes, we have trials and we, yes, we have hurts and yes, we have things that we go through. But praise God, He doesn't change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we have to stand on that. We have to be willing to just acknowledge who God is and say He's great, even in the trials, even in the tribulation. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We are glad you are here this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is good. And if you're joining us tonight online, we're glad to have you with us as well. You know, God, his presence has been here. I mean, we have been feeling the, the spirit of God move in our services over the last several weeks. There's been a shift. There's been a change. And I'll tell you, it's powerful walking into the presence of God. And it doesn't matter how many people are in the congregation because our God is here. Amen. His spirit is here. So with that being said, I'm glad you're here. And I just wanted to share a couple of announcements. Um, you know, don't forget our Wednesday night midweek word on Wednesday. We had an awesome word this week, and I know a lot of us really needed that word. I went and listened to, to it twice because I needed to hear it to stand on God's word and what it means to stand by Elder Tracy Thompson. And we'll have a word this week. Just I know that God uses these words to minister to us. And then we have this coming Saturday, we have a prayer walk that we're doing joining with Freedom Fellowship Church, they are going to be marching or walking and praying over our community, over our children, our families, our schools, and our nation and the world. And we're going to be joining together with them. I believe it starts at, I forgot the time now, it starts at 9 a.m. Is that correct? I don't know. It's in the newsletter. Check your newsletter. But we'll be culminating. They'll be starting at Freedom Fellowship Church in Dale City and walking to um, Hillendale Park, which is a, it's like a three-quarter mile walk. If you can't do the walk, you can come and start it at, at the church and then drive over to the park, and then we're going to have a time of worship and fellowship and, I believe, some food and stuff. There's also a Facebook sign-in, so if you're on Facebook, you can, you can um, search for that and, and sign in for that as well. So that's Saturday morning. Now, this next announcement I don't want to make. So bear with me, please. But this week, we lost a dear brother in the Lord. Um, if you have been going to this church for a long time, you have seen this man. He would sit out at our book table before COVID when we'd had our book table set up. And he was the friendly face that would always be ready to, to give you a, a handshake, a hug, or to tell you about the books we have. He was amazing. And that's our dear brother, David Hosek. Now, some of you may not have known, but he was diagnosed in late December, early January with gallbladder cancer. And uh, Pastor TJ and I, we have fought with them through the whole thing. We've walked that journey. And um, he, was, he was doing great because he was victorious for a good long time. And then just there was a turn for a worse about a month ago, and things didn't seem to be looking good. But you know what? Through it all, his faith was increasing. His strength was increasing in who he was in God. And we stood with them, and Susan and Melissa and Christopher, and we stood with them through that time. So we said goodbye to David on Friday. 
Um, so can you please, if you will, please keep them in prayer, the Hosek family. Um, we now have a widow in our midst that we need to take care of, church. Amen. And um, uh, we will have information. We do not have the arrangements yet. We know it will probably be Friday or Saturday. Um, if it is Saturday, we'll, you know, we'll, obviously, the if it conflicts with the prayer walk, we will probably not be participating as much. But um, we will know on Tuesday. Um, so be looking in your emails. We'll send out an email notice of the information for the funeral arrangements. It will be in Alexandria later this week. Um, so please, if you can be there, we would really, I know Susan could use the support of her church family. Amen. Amen. All right. And at this time, I'm going to hand it over to Brother Landy. All right, church family, let's get ready to give this morning. And you know the ways to give. You can go to our website at churchpluggedin.com and click on the Give Now tab. You can also text in your tithes and offerings to 703-997-4640. You can mail in your gifts of love to the Connection Church, P.O. Box 7658, Woodbridge, Virginia, 22195. Let's go to a familiar passage of Scripture, Philippians 4, 19. 15 through 19, and we're all familiar with verse 19, but we want to read it in context and see what Paul wrote to us. Philippians 4, starting at the 15th verse, reads, For I want you to know that the Philippian church was the only church that supported me in the beginning as I went out to preach the gospel. You were the only church that sowed into me financially. And when I was in Thessalonica, you supported me for well over a year. Verse 17, and I mention this not because I'm requesting a gift, but so that your fruit of your generosity may bring you an abundant reward. I now have all I need more than enough. I'm abundantly satisfied, for I have received the gift you sent from Ephrodites and viewed it as a sweet sacrifice, perfumed with the fragrance of your faithfulness, which is so pleasing to God. And here's the verse we're all familiar with, verse 19. I am convinced that my God will fully satisfy every need you have, for I have seen the abundant riches of glory revealed to me through Christ Jesus. And we're familiar with the King James Version of this, that my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So today's passage reminds us, along with Ephesians 6, 8, that Whatever we make happen for others, God will make happen for us. So as you give today, know without any doubt, you have a covenant with Almighty God that he said that he will take care of every need you have according to his riches and glory, right? So I want you to chew on that this morning. You have a covenant with Almighty God that when you get involved with what he's doing, he said, I'll get involved with what you're doing. So for those who are present in the sanctuary, we want to remind you just to drop off your gifts of love as you exit the door. And for those here in the sanctuary and online, we want to thank you for your continued support here at The Connection. Amen. morning church how many's ready for the word there's lots of things I could say right now and I, I could say all kinds of stuff because of everything that's happened this week but you know what I just want to dive right in and get into the word this morning amen uh, last week we talked about knowing the Holy Spirit and it is vital in our relationship with God and there's two things that we have to keep in mind as we go through this series on the Holy Spirit, and that is, number one, the Holy Spirit is a divine person. He is a divine person. He's not a mystical power. We need to honor Him as a divine person in our life. We must recognize the Holy Spirit as supreme in authority. He is supreme it's the Holy Spirit that manifests on the earth. It's the Holy Spirit that manifests within you. It's the Holy Spirit that speaks through you to others. A amen. Because 
God the Father is in heaven and Jesus is the right hand of God. So that's the Holy Spirit that should be our primary focus in our relationship with God. We pray through the Holy Spirit. And what does he do? He shows us Jesus. Oh, man, and that's the good part because he shows us. Before we continue, let's just pray one more time. Father, this morning I thank you for your word. Lord, I think your word never returns void. And I thank you that we could just set aside everything for a few moments today and we can focus on you and what you have for us. Speak to everyone special this morning. Lord, may this message this morning be your words and not my own. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. John Bevere said this, Everywhere we go, he goes. That is an intimate association. Therefore, he is deeply affected by what we allow in our lives. And we talked about this last week and even the week before, that we don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit in anything. And the only way to not grieve the Spirit is to know the Spirit, is to know Him. The only way that I cannot get my wife upset is because I, I, I know her, you know. Now, she gets upset at me all the time. Why is that? Because I ignore what I know about her. All right? How many know? But, but hey, we do that with God. We'll do that with God. And we'll say things like, and it'll even come out of my mouth, well, I know I'm not supposed to do this, but there's no buts. You're supposed to keep doing what you're doing. It's not a however. No. We, we, we want to flesh out. You know, We want to do what we want to do a lot of times. Rather than submitting to the Spirit of God and doing the right thing. And trust me, that's where the peace is. It's not in you getting your way. Right. The, amen. Oh man, I'm telling you this morning, there, there's some things in here. Open up your hearts. L listen to this today because I, I'm going to tell you it makes, a, it makes a big difference. Because the Holy Spirit lives within us. And it is so important that we recognize Him in our lives every single day. Not just part of the time. And we keep on believing. Keep on believing. Okay, Doubting Thomas. How many remember that? You know, Thomas was, he was dubbed Doubting Thomas. After Jesus was raised from the dead, the disciples were all in a room except for Thomas. And then suddenly Jesus appears. And then Jesus had to convince him, the, the disciples there, he wasn't a ghost, you know. And then the ten, the, the, the ten disciples that were there without Thomas, they began to rejoice in the resurrection. Here's Jesus, he's risen from the dead, and now we're rejoicing over this miracle. And then they began to share after, you know, Jesus sometime, and Jesus went away. Then they went and shared the experience with Thomas. And after Thomas heard everything that happened, here's what Thomas said in John 20, verse 25. Unless I see in his hands... The print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side. I will not believe. Now, I believe Thomas gets a bad rap. I really do. And I, I think I've talked about this before. And we go, oh, how awful that Thomas doubted. I, I don't know if it was as much of doubt, I mean, he, there was doubt there, but I think Thomas wanted the same experience that those ten disciples had. I believe Thomas, right then and there, he was jealous. I know, and, and how do I know? Because I am a disciple of God, and I know how that would feel if that were me. I, I mean, you put yourself in his shoes, this miraculous thing, can you imagine the excitement that the disciples were telling Thomas about what happened? How much exci how excited they were. It's like somebody telling you something super exciting like a movie they saw or whatever or something that happened, but, but it, it just some amazing thing and you missed it. You know, the one that, that kills me is when I, I see, uh, and I'm happy for everybody who does it, okay? 
they, get, they go away because I've gone away. This year, I got to go away, and my wife and I, we went to, to Jamaica. Her sister blessed us with a trip, church. Somebody say hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. You know, okay. And we had the butler service in the whole nine. And see, before that trip, I had seen others who had done that stuff, and I see that white sand and that clear water, and how do I feel? Church, I was jealous. Admit it, you were too when you saw it, right? You know, there's something, and they're excited, you know, it's like it's all blown up on Facebook with 15 pictures and, you know, the, all the excitement. You know, they got the snorkeling stuff on or whatever it is, you know, that they were doing out there. They got their drinks in their hand. They're just living it up. And we're here in northern Virginia with traffic and... Right? So we, we get jealous. And Thomas, I believe he was jealous. He wanted that experience with God. And then something awesome happened. All the disciples were together again, but this time Thomas was there. Jesus suddenly appears. And before doing anything else, the first thing Jesus did was this right here. Then he said to Thomas in verse 27, reach your finger here and look at my hands and reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord, my God. He recognized him because he knew him. Mm. Jesus said to him in verse 29, Thomas because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. How many's ever felt like the disciples? Oh my goodness. They were right there with Jesus all the time. That would have been the coolest thing ever to see Jesus and doing all the and being in his presence. I would have no problem with my relationship with God if he was right there like that, like the disciples were. Oh, that would just be the best. How many's ever thought that kind of stuff? Something along those lines. Oh, man, I know I have. I read through the Gospels, and I, I mean, you know, I'm looking, and I'm, I'm starting to get jealous. They got to see some stuff, man, I didn't get to see. But then I think about running water and toilets and all those things and AC, and then I... I you know, <laughs> thank God that I live in the time that I live in with all the technology. Hallelujah. Man, let's just take a minute and thank the Lord for toilets. <laughs> right? So, <laughs> oh, glory to God. In essence, Jesus was stating, though, he was saying, Thomas, there's a blessed group of people that will see, mm, that will believe without seeing, rather. They, they, they're going, there's a blessed group of people that will believe without seeing. They don't even have to. See, I don't believe this was Jesus rebuking Thomas. Jesus was simply making a statement of fact. Jesus was saying the level of intimacy available to those who know me by my spirit capital S, it's much greater than that of knowing me in the physical sense. See, we have to understand the disciples were sitting there, but see, when Jesus went to lay his head down and went to sleep, and Peter went over here and went to sleep, guess what? God was not inside of Peter right there. The Holy Spirit hadn't been come. But see, you and I, no, 24 hours a day, every minute, every second, God is with you, within you. So when one of the disciples said, you know what, we need some food. Hey, Jesus, if it's cool with you, I'm going to go over here to the market and get us a little something, something. And Jesus said, no problem. So here goes one of the disciples, and they're going to get something at the market. What did they just do? They just left the presence of Jesus. But see, wherever you go... Wherever I go, we carry it with us. 
See, mm, and this is what Jesus was saying when he said to, there's a blessed group of people because they believe without seeing. So, what did he mean? He meant this. Look at this statement here. A deeper intimacy can be achieved by faith than it can by sight. I, now, this is hard for us because in the natural, and how we live our lives, we, we got these things called eyeballs, okay? And we've got smell and touch. We have all these senses, and we, we rely on them a lot. And it can be hard for us to, to, you know, just rely on faith alone or believing. Understand that there's three levels of relationship. Number one, there's the physical level. Number two, the soul level. And number three, the spiritual level. The first level is the lowest, most superficial level. It's the natural, the physical level. Many romantic relationships begin right here. And there's nothing wrong with that. I looked at her when I first saw her. I did not have a soul level connection with my wife. The only thing I thought, she looked good. And she still does look good. She is the most beautiful woman on the earth. Sorry, ladies, you all look pretty, you're wonderful and all that, but you're second, third, fourth, fifth, ten. Okay, do you understand? She is the most beautiful woman on the earth. And there isn't a soul on this earth that could convince me otherwise. You could take all day talking to me about that, all week. And I will laugh in your face all week <laughs> because I know what I know. She is the most beautiful woman in the world. Now see, when I first saw her, that was the physical level, the natural level. With my natural eyes, I saw her. But it's the lowest level of relationship. You know, and unfortunately, a lot of couples, when they get married, they get married on that level right there. And they've never progressed to the second level. And so they stay at a superficial level. And all they did was, oh, I'm attracted to him. Oh, I'm attracted to her. Who cares if we don't always get along? Who cares if we can't agree on much or we don't have any interest at all? And you know, Just who cares about all the other stuff? She looked good. He looked good. That's all that matters. And we just stay, okay, at that physical level many times. There's, there's many marriages like that. In these cases, the soul level is undeveloped. It's underdeveloped. The wedding bells chime, the honeymoon ends, and then guess what? Life happens. And all that natural, oh, she looked good, he looked good, that goes out the window when life happens. You better have a deeper connection. Mm. See, if a man and a woman don't commit to a deeper connection, the woman will pursue her interest with her friends, the man will pursue his interest with his friends. They'll wind up just coexisting. That was never God's intention for marriage. The soul level or the personality, this is the personality of a person. This is the level of relationship that existed between David and Jonathan. And yes, a soul level relationship can happen between two men. I, I want you to see this. Okay, in 1 Samuel 18, verse 1, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own. Understand, these two were tight. The love that they had for one another went deeper than just, oh, hey, let's go hang out and do X, Y, and Z. No, 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 no. They were brothers instantly. This couple... Now, now understand, uh, in 2 Samuel chapter 126, when, when Jonathan had died, here's what David said. I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. 
You have been very pleasant to me. Your love to me was wonderful, surpassing the love of women. Now I want to make it really clear because there's a lot of people who have perverted Scripture and said that this was a, a, a homosexual relationship between the two. No, 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 no. David wasn't talking about a perverted physical relationship. There was no physical, physical attraction between them. Their connection was that of the soul and completely free of unnatural physical, that, that physical stuff. Yet they were able to build a bond much deeper than that of the physical level. Which is what David meant when he said the love of women. He was talking about the physical relationship that he had with women. And David had many physical relationships with women, but those, those women did not satisfy in the way of having a deeper relationship with this man who he called brother, and they were like this. What I just told you is the vast majority, we're talking like 95 to 98% of all theologians will tell you what I just said was true. You've only got a handful that they go get a doctorate, but they're perverted and they pervert. Church, I know because I studied it out. I'm not telling you something that, just pulling that out of my, my, my pocket. You can go and study that and look that up. The relationship between David and Jonathan was that uh, a, a deep connection on a soul level that was deeper than the physical. And it, it was one of those things, like when Jonathan was hurt, David was hurting. When David was hurting, Jonathan hurt. And when Jonathan died, David, oh, it devastated David because his brother had died. Now, the soul level is the level on which marriages should be built. Don't get me wrong, the physical aspect of the relationship is important. That's where you know, relationships begin. I'm extremely attracted to my wife, but there's deeper levels of relationship that can and could be achieved between husband and wife. The fact is, church, Carrie Ann's personality is more endearing to me than her physical beauty. If it was just beauty alone, we wouldn't be sitting in right here right now. If, it, if that's all it was, we went to a deeper level real quick because it was all about her personality. The thing that at first attracted to my wife, yes, was her physical beauty, but there was something else there. Because see, when I first laid eyes on her, her hands were in the air and she was praising God. And she had this countenance on her face. There was something else that radiated out of her that, that I connected with. And I said, I had never seen a woman like that before my age. You know. There's so much more we could say. But understand that some spouses, they've left their mates for someone else because they allowed themselves to have a soul relationship with somebody else. John Bevere talks about in the book in the, uh, that we're, we've been you know, gleaning from on the Holy Spirit, and he talks about a man who had six kids, walked up to him after a service one day. And you know, a couple of them, they're little kids, you know, running around. You got some a little older. There's six kids. And he went up to him, and he began to talk to him, and he found out that his wife had left him, had just left him because of an online relationship she had with another man. And this bond that was created between this woman and this other man, and they connected on such a level that it was stronger than the, the, her natural inclination to take care of her children and to be with her children, and she left the home for this other man. See, when your soul is knit to someone, it's very powerful. We need to understand that. Church, we don't want to have a superficial relationship with our God. We want to have a deeper relationship with God. The soul level of relationship often requires little to no physical attraction. That's why this woman, she's online with this man. She wasn't physically in his presence when she was getting to know him. It was all online, but yet her soul began to get knit with that man. And she left her husband. The soul level of relationship. Let me say this. 
the thing is, is when we, when we get away from the physical as, as a man and a woman and two, two come together, when we get away from the physical we, we can, and we focus on the, on the soul level, okay, what we have to do is push aside the physical. When I go on a trip away from my wife, I'm, I'm just going to tell you, I can't, I, it's hard. I hate it. I can't stand it. But the only way for me to have contact with her and to bond with her is on a soul level. When we talk, we, we, it, it's not physical because I'm not right there with her. And then I can go to the third level of relationship, which is the spiritual level. And yes, I can even do that with my wife. Understand, the spiritual level is the highest and deepest level of relationship. This is the level Jesus was referring to when he was talking to Thomas. He was saying, hey, believe without seeing. Get, get this right here in 1 Corinthians 2.11. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? In other words, you can't know the true thoughts or motives of a person unless you're in tune with that person's spirit. You can't really know what they're thinking. You don't know. Now, since b both my wife and I have an intimate relationship with the Spirit, capital S, we are able to commune on a spiritual level. This is why we pray together from time to time. It makes our relationship stronger. Before we got married, we were very careful not to pray together too much. It was very, very little. I just wouldn't do it. Why? Because it's the deepest level of relationship. And the attraction to her would be that much stronger. And church, I don't know if I'd have been able to wait. You know what I'm saying? Now that's just the truth. How do I know this? Many examples that have happened. It has happened to so many people. They start praying together, and next thing you know, they're kissing. And they didn't even, they, they weren't even, didn't even know they had an attraction. And they really didn't. But what it was is they began to pray. Prayer is an intimate act. Church, I don't pray with just anybody. Hey, amen. No, there's a difference for praying for someone than with someone. I'm not going to, look, I love a lot of people. But I'm not going to just go join hands with somebody and sit there and start praying in the Spirit with them for a while. That's not going to happen. With me and my wife, absolutely. We pray with my parents and the, and the staff. We get together, uh, Elder Joe and, and, and our lead intercessor, Connie Motes. And she sends out the prayer request. I called her the other day without, you know, just, just to pray. Hey, we need to pray. I don't pray with anybody and just anybody. There's very few people. Amen, church. We got to be careful. Amen. Verse, verse 11. Again, this time the whole level, the whole verse. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the spirit, capital S, of God. The Greek word here translated as thoughts, the word thoughts, is best defined as a state of being or the composition of. So Paul's basically saying that no one can know the true composition of God, meaning the deep matters of the heart, without coming to know the Spirit of God. You will not know the deep things of God without knowing the Spirit. It's impossible. Look at this statement here. No means to have an understanding that is much more than superficial knowledge that can be obtained with little or no effort. Are, are, are you seeing this? Practically everyone, it, it, let me explain it this way. Go ahead and black the screen out for me, son. Everybody knows who the president is right now. We have President Joe Biden. But you don't know him. <laughs> If you did, I'd know, because you would have called and said, guess what? I just hung out with the president. You know, you'd have been all right. I'd have known. I don't know President Biden from Adam. I don't know him. Do I know stuff about him? Oh, yeah. Why? 
Because what? I, he, he's on the TV. I look online. I see my news feed. I see all this and that. I see things that he says. I hear, hear this and that. But do I know the deep things that are in President Joe by his thoughts, his desires? Do I know that any of that? No. 99.9999999% of people in America, they have no clue. We just don't know. And this is why, you know, they, we have all these politicians, they say a bunch of stuff before they get the president, and then you notice how it changes. <laughs> Don't you just love that? And they all do it. There ain't a single one during my lifetime I know that just backed every single thing up that they said. Or they didn't change or flop on something. There is something there they flop on. Some are more egregious than others, but we won't go there. Understand. They say all that stuff, but talk is what? You got to know somebody. You can say all the kind of things you want to say as a Christian. I'm a Christian. I'm a di Do you know the Spirit? Do you know the Spirit of God? Not just what we here on a Sunday morning, and then we go what the, out, out throughout our week, we don't pray, read the word, nothing, and we just, all of our knowledge is what we hear on a Sunday, or some, maybe we turn on a preacher during the week even, and here's some, I know somebody like that, they have no, they, they have told me, they told me, years, it's been years since they really like read the Bible, years, and all they do is hear on Sunday mornings from time to time, or hear a message online, Maybe they'll turn on T.D. Jakes or whoever, and I love them all. Well, not all, but I love a lot of them. <laughs> and, and let me just say, it, their, their theology is messed up. I'm serious. Their theology is goofed, even though they've heard a bunch of my messages. I'm like, how in the world did you get to thinking like that? It's because they're not in the Word. The Spirit can't lead you into all truth if you're not in the Word and Him illuminating that stuff to you. Uh, amen. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 12, the next verse. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things Freely given to us by God. No one knows the thoughts of God except His Spirit. But He's given us that Spirit. Amen? So through relationship with the Spirit of God, now we can have intimacy with the Creator on the spiritual level, the highest level of relationship. Paul went to this level with the Holy Spirit. He writes in Galatians 1 verse 11, But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul received the revelation of Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit that was within him. By the Spirit's inspiration, Paul wrote the majority of, of, of the books in the New Testament. Yet he never walked with Jesus in the physical. How could he do that? Because the Spirit is the one who fully reveals Jesus. Remember Jesus' words. See, even see the disciples didn't have the Spirit, so they didn't even know all the things that they could have known had they had the Spirit at that time. Hear this, what Jesus said in John 16, this time uh, verse 12 through 13 in the New Living Translation. Get this, there is so much more I want to tell you, but you can't bear it now. When the Spirit of truth comes, He'll guide you into all truth. He will not speak of His own, but will tell you what He has heard. He will tell you about the future. Yes, the Spirit will reveal to you things to come. And you don't even have to be a prophet. That's good. I like that. But see, you can only achieve that through the deepest level, the best level, the highest level, which is the spiritual level of relationship. You've got to, be, have, you've got to have that relationship with God in the same way that I have it with my wife. I mean, it, it's greater with God because it's all spirit and it's all believing. I, there's no physical to interfere. Amen. I just saw a light bulb come on with someone. Praise God. This is good. Like Paul, you and I have been given the opportunity to follow Jesus without any possible conflicts of previous misunderstandings developed through physical interaction. 
the differences between the disciples and Paul was that Paul never saw Jesus in the physical. It was all by revelation. Whereas, and that's why Peter said some of the things that Paul writes, if you go and you look, he said, I, I don't fully understand everything he writes. Why? Because he had the interference of having the physical relationship with Jesus. Now that's deep. I mean, I didn't think about that till this week. Never saw it. That's how important it is for us to believe without seeing. Our faith needs to stay strong. Like Paul, you and I, we've been given the opportunity to follow Jesus without any of those distractions. The only way for us to commune through God is through His Spirit that dwells within us. We need to know Him on the deepest level. Church, it's because our flesh, and I'm almost finished, but our flesh is unredeemed for now. Our spirits are redeemed. They're in the exact likeness and image of Jesus. You can see that in 1 John 4, 17. We won't read it for sake of time. Our souls are in the process of being redeemed. You can see that in James 1, 21. That's also the renewing of your mind is part of that process. We are consistently renewing our minds, so our soul is in the process of being redeemed. But our physical bodies have not yet experienced redemption. Have you ever noticed how easy it is that we grow tired of things? You know, our, our, in the natural, we're like, man, oh, I want this, this car. You know, and then pff, a couple months later, we're ready for another one. Oh, the, the, man, this TV, this big old TV, man, I like this, you know, or this, this thing. I can tell you what, I've been wanting a pool table for a long time, but I'll bet you when I get one, Ron, you have to tell me if this is true. After a few months, you're just like, oh, well, it's no big deal, isn't it? See, it's the same. See, I knew it, but I still want one. <laughs> right? So it, it, it happens. Like, we're, we're so quick to just, you know, we get over it. Because it's all natural, it's all physical, it's all flesh, right? So we grow tired. So God in his goodness says, I'm not revealing myself to my people physically. I'm going to make a way for them to commune with me by my spirit so they can really know me. So it's not something that will just fade away. It's almost like God saying, I'm going to have a long distance relationship with the ones I love so they can really get to know my heart. He's allowing us to get to know him on the deepest level before we ever get to know him on the physical level. This is why Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5, 16, Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. So he's talking about those like the disciples who knew him in the flesh, but we don't know him that way any longer. We know him by the Spirit, the Spirit of the living God. And if we neglect to enter into communion with the Spirit, we deny ourselves the opportunity to know the Son. Because the Holy Spirit reveals Jesus. And the Spirit searches all things within the heart and the mind of God to reveal Jesus to us. You want a deep relationship with God, you've got to move beyond superficial knowledge of Him. And enter into the journey of discovering who He truly is. The journey is only possible through communion with the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God. This is why we can't hold on to traditions, customary patterns of thought related to the Holy Spirit that are not rooted in the eternal Word of God. When we allow misconceptions, personal bias, negative experiences to skew our understanding of the Spirit, we will not enjoy the full promise of God's glorious presence, presence in our lives we cannot know God apart from His Spirit, just period. And these things, so many times, misconceptions get in there. I want you to, it, before I read this quote, I, I want you to hear this really quickly. I see things sometimes, you know, out there. Christians. And they will post things and I'm just like, my God, have mercy, where... Are you even praying? Are you praying to the same God that I am? Because why would the Spirit tell you that and tell me the opposite? The Spirit doesn't do that, church. You know how I know that? 
because absolute truth is a real thing. And the absolute truth is the word of God. And Jesus said that this Holy Spirit will lead us into all truth. I ain't talking about some of the questionable things out there. I'm talking about like real obvious stuff here. It's like, Spirit ain't going to tell you that's okay. Spirit's not going to tell you that David and Jonathan had that relationship like that. Oh, no. Spirit ain't going to tell you. It wasn't a perverted relationship. It was a wonderful, loving relationship that he had with his brother. That's what the Spirit revealed to me the first time I read that. I was young. I was probably 12, 13 years old when I read about David and Jonathan in the Bible for myself. And I never once had that thought. And years later, I found out some people thought that and I went, what? Spirit didn't tell me that. Because even at 11, 12, and 13 year old, when I read the Bible, the Spirit revealed things to me about His Word. And I knew what it meant. Why? Because the Spirit led me to that. But yet I see these other things and different Christians getting up behind pulpits. I see Christians posting stuff online and I'm like, you're not praying. You are not in the Word. You are not praying in the Spirit. Come to find out some of them that I know personally, they actually told me they don't. I said, well, you know, after I found that out, I walked away and I was like, that explains a lot. Now I know. Because the Spirit will not tell you a totally different you know, thing. Uh, tr- tell me that this is true and then tell you the opposite. It doesn't happen. John Bevere says, I believe you can have a relationship with the Spirit where you desire what He desires and feel what He feels. The deepest level of relationship, the spiritual level, is available to you. Church, this is good. And when you have the deepest level, you're not going to go astray and start posting lies of this world and the lies of the enemy online saying that that is truth. Let's all stand. On this level, we discover an intimacy with the Creator unlike any other. But you've got to seek to know who the Holy Spirit is if you want to walk in close communion with Him. It only happens by reading the Word of God in prayer. Are you, for those of you who are Spirit-filled, meaning you, you have a prayer language, are you praying in the Spirit every day? And if so, how much do you do that? And look, and that's not meant to be condemning. And those listening online, I'm not trying to condemn. I'm trying to get you to a place where you're at a deep level. You're at a deep level with God so that there's victory in your life. Some of you listening to me online, uh, and I feel this in the spirit right now, you don't have the victory that you need to have. And what you need to do is get on your knees and begin to pray in the Spirit every day. And God said that situation will just begin to turn around in your life. And now the victory will begin to come in. The peace will come in. Hallelujah. See, when you pray in the Spirit, the peace begins to come. The comfort begins to come. It doesn't matter what's going on. It doesn't matter what happens. Because it's just you and the Spirit at that moment. And everything else is falling away. And now you're being led into truth. Hallelujah. Glory to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 and 18 says, But whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. For the, spirit, for, where the, the, for the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of God. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. This morning, church, let's allow the Spirit to do a work in our hearts. Let's ask Him to remove any hindrance, any veil from us. So we need to be able to say to God, God, I don't want to be that person that, that, that propagates a lie, that, that, that promotes lies and, 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 and doesn't have the truth. I want to be the one that has the truth of God in all things that I say, all things that I do, all the things I post online. I want the truth of the Word of God to come forth from me at all times. All times. Not just some of the time. 
And church, in the moment when you begin to lay the word down, and the moment you begin to stop praying in the spirit and praying, the moment you do that and you start listening to the things of this world and the philosophies of man, it will contaminate you. you got to shut that stuff off. Look, you got to turn the news off sometimes. you got to turn other stuff on, on, that's online and reading and the stuff we get into and we research and we go into this and that. Sometimes we're going to turn all that off and let's just pray in the Spirit. Can we get in the Word of God and, pray, and, and make it number one above all these other sources that we ingest and we put into us? I know people that want to listen to, to all these different things so they can understand and have the perspective. Look, your greatest understanding is going to come from the Spirit, not from listening to all that other stuff. And look, I'm one that researches and I go and I look at all that. But it's not at the expense of me praying in the Spirit. It will not be at the expense of my time in the Word and studying in the Word of God. Church, we need to get back to the place. Like in times of old, look, they, and, and look, I'm not... I'm saying that in the United States, we are not outpacing, Christianity is not outpacing the population growth. That's how I know that when we were 60 and 70 years ago, when we were on fire and, and, the, and Christianity was growing, people were in the Word. That's the only way it happens. That's how I know. You say, well, how do you know? Well, that's because the statistics tell me, and I've seen the map and the experts talk about it, and the color change on the map for the United States on our growth in Christianity. We're still stagnant church I'm talking about as a whole not this church I'm talking about as a whole in the United States and it's time for the for the church in America and preachers to begin to get up and preach and start saying that the word of God needs to be number one in your life you need to spend time in the word of God and not be so wimpy and get up here and saying oh well it's okay if you don't read it uh, baloney you need to be in the word of God and pray every day I remember when I was young and I was little growing up in church, the preacher would get up and say, you need to pray at least three. And he'd put a number on it. Look, I'm not trying to put a number or be legalistic or this or that. But you know what? He wasn't trying to do it either. What he was trying to do was help those people that were listening from, the, help the church grow. He was trying to help you grow, me grow. He, that's what the preachers need to be doing from the pulpit is telling them the truth that's in the Word of God. Church, this is just how I feel. This is what's burning in me. This is what's just, I, I mean, I can't shake it. Because we need a change in this country, in America. And that change begins with you and me. And it begins in the church that I know of right now that's preaching the same thing I'm preaching somewhere in the United States. Carrie Ann brought up a, 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 lesson, said, Man, a lesson somebody was doing or whatever and says, It's the same thing you've been preaching. Same thing. I said, praise God. Cool. And when you're hearing in the Spirit, the church will be on that level. They will begin to preach the same thing. They will, it may be in a little different flavor or what have you, but it will be the same. This morning, can we go before God and say, God, remove veils. Remove the mindset. Remove the hindrances, the natural and the physical hindrances, and let me just get into your word this week. Let me just pray every day. Let me commit to pray every day. Can we do that this morning? Hallelujah. And if that's you, and you're like, man, I just want to even go more. I've been praying this week. Maybe, I've been, maybe you've been in the word this week, but now you're just like, man, I, just, I need more of it. I want more of it. If that's you, just raise your hand. I mean, that, that's me. We need more of it, because the more of that you get, the more victory you get. Hallelujah. Father, right now, I thank you that you are revealing through your spirit, through each one of us, Lord, every mindset that's not pleasing to you. And we break it now in Jesus' name. Every bit of offense, all of the things that we get upset about that don't matter, Lord, I, we just put it all under your feet right now. I thank you, Lord. We just pray right now for the body of Christ in America. Lord, we just agree, church, right now. We need to pray for the church, Lord, that the church's eyes would be open. Lord, where there's pastors, where their eyes are closed, Lord, I thank you for doing a supernatural work in them and opening up their eyes, Lord, that they would stress you, that they would really stress you, Lord, in praying in your spirit, seeking 
seeking you with all of their hearts, with all of their minds, Lord. I thank you for the anointing coming back into our churches. Lord, revivals beginning to take place and outbreaking in all of the states. Every single state in America, Lord, I thank you that there are revival would just break out in each one, Lord, and your spirit would flow. Lord, I thank you for an increase of miracles taking place as we submit to your spirit, Lord. Even this week, I thank you for an increase of miracles in every one of the sound of my voice. Lord, every miracle that you're, you're thinking of right now that you want, just begin to, and that, 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 that your heart is burning on, say, Lord, I need this. I want you just to put it before the Lord right now. Set it down right now at his feet and say, God, I'm going to submit to your spirit and Lord I'm expecting a miracle in this situation in my finances in my family in my relationships in every single area of my life I thank you Lord that I have victory because the veil has been removed and now I see clearly I'm not beholding myself in the glass Lord I see you hallelujah I see you and nothing but you I am in tune with your spirit here in Jesus name and Lord, I thank you for bringing back a spirit of intercession into the church that we would be able to cry out to you like never before. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. That we would be submitted to your spirit in all things. Hallelujah. Glory to your name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Ooh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Carrie Ann, can you grab the microphone? Come up here, sweetheart. Come on up here. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Let's see what the Lord's saying. Hallelujah. Check one, two. Here we go, sweetie. Go ahead. This weekend, this Friday. Yes. Last Friday night, I had a dream. Mm-hmm. Got it. And I took a microphone in that dream. And it was a fight. It was a fight to take the microphone and the pastor who was there. What he saying was wrong. Everything he was saying was wrong. It felt wrong. It felt wrong. It felt wrong. Until I got up on that stage and when I took the microphone, I started to pray in the spirit. And I felt that the stage was smaller. The stage was smaller than it was when he was up there. And I said, something's not right. And I started to pray in the spirit. And as I started to pray, I kept hearing shouts in the crowd. But they weren't shouts for God. They weren't shouts for what I was saying. Mm. They were the lies of the enemy. And in that moment, I felt defeated. And I looked over, and the pastor, he smirked at me. He didn't smile. He didn't do anything. He smirked at me. And I said, that's a lie. That's a lie. It's wrong. What you're doing here is wrong. There's so many lies of the enemy and in our nation, and there is false doctrine, and it sounds good. This morning I read the passage where Jesus is in the wilderness and he's getting tempted. The only way we're going to get past the lies of the enemy that's in our schools, that's in our churches, is by getting in the Word. Mm. I felt that in my spirit so much this morning. Everything that I've been reading, every scripture that I've been coming across has lined up with the word. And every scripture that I have found has been what he is preaching the next Sunday. I have never felt this hungry. I have never really enjoyed studying. But what I thought when I was in the car yesterday is what grandma, what you taught us so long ago, is we get complacent. We don't think about the words that we're reading. We don't understand the importance. We're lucky where we are. We're lucky to have the freedoms that we have, but we get complacent. We don't know the hardships that other people have had to go through to have the word of God. And she says, you have the word of God, but what if you don't? What if you don't have the word of God anymore? What if it's taken from you? We may never see that in this country, or we may not think that we'll ever see it in this country, but that doesn't give us the right to be complacent with the word of God. 
It doesn't give us the right to be complacent. I remember there was one time she was at our house. She wouldn't let us do anything until we memorized the scripture. And I remember I read it over a hundred times until I had it deep in my soul. And I said, but the hour cometh. True worshipers of God will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The hour is now where we will fight our battles with the word of God and standing on the word of God and praising him in the presence. It doesn't matter how many people are here right now. It doesn't matter how many are people here on next Sunday or the Sunday after that. We are not to be discouraged by the numbers of people because even though we might not see it now, we will see a revival in this church, in our nation, not just this building, but in our nation and across the world because a cry has gone out for intimacy. People don't know what that call means. They don't know they're calling out for the spirit of God, but they know they need something. And that something is the spirit of God. And there's a hunger and a thirst for it. Amen. 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 Glory to God. See, I didn't know she had that dream. She didn't share that with me about that pastor. And this morning, I'm, I'm talking about what the spirit is showing me about what's coming out of pulpits. I didn't even think about that this week. It's just the spirit just knows what needs to be said and what needs to be prayed. And I believe, I truly believe this, that there are others who are hearing the same thing. Hallelujah. Lord, I just thank you for the difference. I thank you for the difference. Bringing us to the highest level of relationship with you. Putting you number one in all things in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. This morning, if you want prayer of agreement touching anything, Brother Landy and, and Dad's going to come down at this time. You can come forward. I'm just going to say, hey, remember all the announcements. Be sure and let my wife know if you're going to that prayer walk, call, text her, just tell her whatever. We need a, just a general idea because of the fellowship at the end, just who all's coming. And uh, remember the midweek word and, 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 and the, yes, yes, okay, I was going to mention that. And uh, Wednesday, the newsletter should be coming out, um, Wednesday night, I think we'll probably have it done. I think, uh, and, and, and the arrangements will be in there for the host sex. So just be in prayer on all of those things in church, be encouraged. God is good. Amen. Amen. Can we just give the Lord a hand? Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. You're worthy, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. We love you. God bless. And we'll see you on Wednesday night.